So it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Dennis Turner from the University of Yale, a Professor of Historical Theology here to Blackfriars Oxford to give us the annual Las Casas Institute lecture uh, in which he'll be exploring the price of truth, Herbert McCabe on politics, love and death. Dennis, welcome to Oxford, Thank welcome you. to Blackfriars, or rather welcome back. Because oh, back, you're, exactly. You're yes. an old friend of our community. I am indeed, who, yes, yes. You knew Herbert. I knew um, Herbert very well, yes, indeed. And you're coming in our jubilee year at the mm. start of our celebration of the 800th anniversary of mm -hmm. the Order's confirmation. And I, I wondered what it is for you that is most distinctive about our Dominican intellectual tradition here at Blackfriars and in the English province, mm -hmm. and what it might have to say in the contemporary world of academia mm -hmm. and politics? Well, I think in the first place, it's a fact that one associates the Dominicans with having an intellectual tradition. Um, they are kind of the intellects of the church in many ways, I think. Uh, particularly for me, as a full-time academic, although I am semi-retired by now, but I mean, for all my life, I've been uh, a, a full-time academic. Um, the idea that you of not disengaging the intellectual life from the business of teaching mm -hmm. and preaching. I think the integration of the two is, is a spectacular achievement of that 800-year tradition. Um, and I think, among other things, it's a way of reading Thomas Aquinas. He's too often read on the page. One ignores the fact that he wrote those pages in order to be able to educate and teach and teach to teach preachers. And I think it's that connection between intellect, teaching, preaching, uh, which to me is, the, is the, the great charisma of the Dominicans, which um, I think Herbert McCabe represented mm -hmm. very perfectly, uh, in, a, in a very challenging and a very exciting sort of way. And I think it's worth celebrating that. So if one's celebrating 800 years of the uh, order doing these things, Herbert McCabe says a great deal about what the significance of that is. And, um, I, I like to own it myself. I think I think it's worth passing it on under great intellects of uh, theological intellects of the late twentieth century. Mm -hmm. In many ways, you've, you've anticipated what I was about to ask, mm. which is, what is it about Herbert that um, that makes him such an attractive theological figure and makes him have such wide mm. appeal across the the span of, of um, lay people in the pew mm. right up to, to people like yourself in the, the highest ranks of academia? It's very hard to put one's finger on it. I mean, one, one thing about, it is, about Herbert was that he was a brilliant communicator of highly complex ideas. And that, I mean, to, to achieve that kind of higher level simplicity is, is an extraordinary thing to be able to do. Um, uh, and I mean that's what I see as being so Dominican about him is that uh, well, not every Dominican can do that but I think every Dominican wants to do that and uh, Herbert represents that in, in a supreme kind of way and uh, one of the um, ways in which that shows in Herbert is curiously in the almost entire absence of footnotes in anything mm. that he wrote he just absorbed material and it went through his brain and came out from his brain, through his mouth, in teaching, in communication. It was essentially a communicative act. Mm -hmm. And I, I think uh, that's, I think, what's most powerful about, uh, about, about Herbert's charisma, if you like. I mean, uh, you know, what makes him so important is that he is instantly intelligible and constantly surprising. Um, in other words, you, you never realise that you thought such and such a thing until Herbert told you, you you thought that because and all of a sudden you realize yes I did think that uh, he, he he's he's got where I'm coming from in a way that I didn't know I was coming from there and that, that I think is the essential art of the teacher it goes right back to Plato the idea that teaching is a sort of recollection of something and when you say oh yes of course mm -hmm. Herbert did that to you so often. You sort of said, of course I get that. I've always thought that, but it was only when he told me that I thought that, that I, I could have caught on. And I think that is a really remarkable sort of thing for a teacher to be able to do. One aspires as a teacher. One aspires to be able to do that, and one learned how to teach from Herbert. Yeah. Uh, at least I did, anyway. And I think others have, too. And we have that in the, in the first question of the summer. Aquinas describes that the, the doctor of theology is leading by the hand, hand exactly, the beginner. Exactly, and, um, exactly. and, and looking at your own mm. journey, um, I suppose in the early 80s, uh, 
your publications really looked at um, the relationship between Christianity, Marxism, yeah. pol political mm. theory. Mm. Turning after that to look at the mystical tradition and mm. to Aquinas mm. in particular, mm. in what ways was Herbert somebody who accompanied you on that journey? Well, I, I mean, th that first move of, uh, I mean, the first time I met Herbert was in University College Dublin, I think it was 1966. It was just after the Second Vatican Council. And at that time, Herbert was very closely associated with a group of Cambridge group, which included Terry Eagleton, Adrian Cunningham and others, who were basically Christian Marxists or Catholic Marxists, very distinctively, the so-called slant movement, which, uh, which sort of brought uh, some very traditional theological thinking together with some very radical political thinking. And that immediately appealed to me. I mean, as I say, I, I heard Herbert in 1966 in Dublin talking about the Eucharist and Marx and put the two together in a way which is, again, totally surprising. And once he'd done it, you said, yes, of course, mm -hmm. in that, as I said. Uh, and so I kind of followed through that. Now, it wasn't, I mean, t I do look back and say, well, OK, in 1983 or 84, I started I started reading John of the Cross and then I started reading The Cloud of Unknowing and then I moved further and further back and I started rereading Thomas Aquinas and, uh, and back to the pseudo Dennis. The whole range of, of medieval and uh, late patristic writers writing about prayer, about the, the, the desire for God and, uh, and the way intellect is challenged by all this and has to work its way through it. And so then I picked up the other side of Herbert, which was, you know, his being deeply influenced by Thomas Aquinas. Somehow or other Wittgenstein came into the mix as well, though quite when it was Wittgenstein, when it was Thomas Aquinas and when it was Herbert, it was an uh, entire mystery to me and it didn't seem to matter. Mm -hmm. uh, but so I, I don't myself see a huge division between the interest in political theology, as one might put it, and the interest in medieval thought, in particular medieval mystical thought. I, I've never ever found a way of integrating them formally in a, in a piece of writing, but I just take it for granted that they connect up with one another. And I think that sort of surprising connection is something that Herbert was absolutely mm -hmm. magnificent at doing um, uh, and very challenging. It's the sort of thing which made you think, reread texts which you'd read in an over-familiar kind of way in an entirely new way. And, and yeah, again, I mean, that's Herbert the teacher the, 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 who, who did that. Uh, by the way, I mean, uh, the books which Brian Davis has put together, you know, which contain this mix of very, very powerful and strongly intellectual pieces and homiletics, preaching, um, uh, where you could move from one to the other just in a seamless and effortless kind of way. Again, that's typically Herbert, and I, I, I repeat, I think that's typically Dominican, and, uh, uh, and that's why I think when asked how, what would you like to talk about in order to celebrate as an outsider, I'm not a Dominican, uh, um, the, the 800th anniversary of um, uh, the Dominican founding of the Dominican Order in 1216, um, it just seemed to me that uh, Herbert was just a perfect model of what I think you want Dominicans to exist to do. Uh, he just did it. And like you wouldn't have known that that's what we needed until somebody like Herbert does it. And then you say, well, of course, that's what we needed. Yeah. Um, uh, and that just seems to me to work. I think it's very powerful, very, very powerful influence. And in your lecture, you, you make an observation that uh, one of the things that fundamentally differentiates Herbert's thought from that of Marx is mm. um, yeah. a profound doctrine of sin, a sin yeah. and a sense yeah. of the fallenness of the yeah. world yeah. and the correlate of that which is grace. grace. And, um, yeah. I think that's something that those who knew Herbert here would, would have sensed in yeah. him yeah. and his yeah. autobiographical I think you make a fair point because, you see, I think uh, I, I sort of picked this up about sin and I thought it was important to say something about this because I, sin isn't a, a, a doctrine of sin isn't a Calvinist monopoly. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, I, I think you know, Herbert had a lot to say about that. I don't think I said enough in that lecture about grace um, uh, and one would need to. Um, uh, I. I I, I think one can't say everything in just the lecture, so I mean it's quite difficult to to to, to give a, a non-unbalanced account of a very complex thinker like Herbert. But uh, I, I think this, that's absolutely right. I mean, you, you 
Marx does not have an adequate sense of sin, to mm -hmm. put it straightforwardly like that. And, uh, and Herbert, I think, you know, differed uh, from Marx in that he didn't think that you know, a social solution, a social revolution was sufficient. As he always said, it's not enough to have a revolution in society, you've got to have a revolution which somehow or other resolves the problem of death. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, unless your, your, your account of how bad things are uh, takes into account the fact that we die as a consequence of the way in which you know, human life is structured sinfully, then you don't quite understand what, how radical you know, the Christian solution is. So he said, you know, the revolution that Christians are talking about is not a revolution in society, it's a revolution in the body. Mm? Yeah. It's, it's in fact about the resurrection. Uh, and I think that's, that's, Herbert, that's Herbert thinking through Marxism and coming out the other side of it, do you see what I mean? But he, he, he didn't believe you could get to the other side without thinking your way through it. Mm -hmm. So he, you needed to be a Marxist, but it was not enough to be a Marxist. Uh, and this is a theme you picked up as well in relation to the Eucharist. And, yeah. And uh, the normativity, if you like, of Christian martyrdom yeah. for a Christian yeah. politics. That's right, that's right. Um, and I wondered how we might think that through in, in the contemporary world. In a previous Las mm -hmm. Casas lecture, a mm -hmm. uh, lecture explored Pierre Claverie and the, the, uh, the Martyrs of Algeria. Mm. Um, but of course we have the institution calling itself the Islamic State. Yes, yes, um, yes. Ah, that's a big set of questions. And, uh, I, 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 I think I would like to, it's always the case when you give a lecture like this that you want to give another one. Uh, you want to give the other one because of what you left out in the, or because of where you've got to in the one that you give. That creates a new agenda and you've actually just put your finger on the, the agenda which kind of arises out of, well at least I think it arises out of the, the lecture I'm proposing to give in a few minutes, but uh, um, uh, I think that question does arise. Where does one go from here? Because translating out this sort of centrality of death and overcoming death as a political thing, mm -hmm. that needs to be cashed out in terms of, okay, so what do we do? Um, and it's the, 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 the easy answer is, well, of course, we just look in admiration at the people who have been martyred over this. I mean, the Oscar Romero's and, uh, uh, and the Bonhoeffer's and, uh, and so on. Uh, but we're not all there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We're not all in that place, I mean. Uh, 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 and I think one has to work this out in terms of a daily practice and not just in terms of a sort of existential occurrence, which some may be faced with and then we look at awe with them but otherwise do nothing ourselves. So the question of how do we live in relation to death? You know, mm -hmm. How do we construct a life in relation to death you know, and resurrection? Uh, uh, that, I think, does need to be cashed out in more, in more practical terms. And Herbert did write some things at that level. I mean, uh, but more often he was talking about, well, what kind of life do you need to live? What kind of virtues do you need to cultivate in order to be the kind of person who will be able to face whatever it is mm -hmm. that you're challenged to be? Uh, rather than working out, well, oh, you know, how do you live out in this context, that context, or another context? So he was at one step, I think, behind, or if you like, in front of the pragmatic questions. Okay, so what does this mean in terms of the price you and I have to pay, who live in a pretty comfortable society where we're unlikely to face the challenge of death? But um, how do we translate it into a daily practice? That, I think, is another step. Mm -hmm. That's not an answer to your question. It's a statement to the effect that I haven't got one just yet. But I think it is a very necessary step to take. I don't think Herbert really did much of working it through beyond that point, uh, the, the general point, do you see what I mean? That, mm -hmm. that, that, um, uh, uh, though sometimes he did, he wrote a famous set of essays on whether the uh, IRA members who were imprisoned in the hospitals and on hunger strike were committing suicide, which he firmly denied. They are certainly not, and he's quite right, of course they're not, any more than the so-called suicide bombers in, uh, of the Islamic culture are committing suicide. They're certainly not committing suicide. Um, uh, they're clearly intending to kill other people with the certainty of their own death, and there's classical moral theology within the Catholic Church, which, which says, no, of course that's not suicide. Um, you don't 
decide just to kill yourself in order to make a point. You decide to kill other people, which you believe to be justified, uh, rightly or wrongly, at the price of your own life, and that's that's you get a VC for that you know, in English military culture anyway. Um, so uh, Herbert wrote this really very scathing article about the uh, that the attitude towards the provisional IRA um, uh, um, uh, hunger strikers. Um, uh, and that, I think, he got him into an awful lot of trouble. Yeah? Um, uh, but uh, he, on the whole, steered clear of actual, if you like, the moral theological problems. I think he wanted to provide a context mm -hmm. for people to think through things for themselves. And that, again, you see, I think is typical Dominican. They're not actually writing a book saying you do this, you do that, you do the other. You, you, the Dominicans want you to take responsibility, as I understand it. I mean, I, I'm preaching to the converted, you tell me. But I mean, as I understand, what I get from Dominicans is, listen, you need to be situated in a certain kind of way with certain kind of dispositions and certain mentalities and then work things out for yourself. And Herbert wrote this famous article about, well, Dominican obedience, which mm -hmm. he said consisted not in top-down military orders coming from a superior, but in community working things out at the expense of an yeah. awful lot of talk and a lot of awful lot of obedience mm -hmm. to the requirements of the community. Which is ultimately obedience to truth. Which is obedience to truth, which is where the, that, 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 that motto mm -hmm. know, of, of the Dominicans, Veritas, uh, it, it is so central. And it is one of the things that bothers me is that goodness gets all the publicity, truth gets a hard time, because mm -hmm. it sounds a bit impassive and cold. But actually, you know, I am the way, the truth and the life seems to me pretty inspiring sort of thing to be aiming for, you know, uh, to, to imitate. You, uh, you mentioned translation, yeah. um, which alludes, I suppose, to the other, the linguistic strand of her, but the yeah. Wittgenstein. And, um, yeah. I suppose I wonder sometimes if if Herbert was somebody who unusually in the modern world was aware of the power of language. Yeah. And I think sometimes we live in an era of the forgetfulness of language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think in one of your, your works you've spoken about uh, the great gift of Aquinas is to allow the words to speak for themselves. themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that is, I, I mean, uh, reading Aquinas, uh, you become aware of an utterly selfless person. Um, who um, didn't want himself to get in the way. Casting a shadow, uh, if he puts himself in the light, then he casts a shadow. And what he does is, he, he talked once, uh, he was raising the question about, is the contemplative life higher than the, 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 than the active life? And he says, well, yes, but the best form of life is the life which combines the contemplative with the active. And so that to simply be a light unto yourself is inadequate. What you need to be is a light for others. And in that way, um, you get yourself out of the light in order for the light to go through you to others. And that is essentially a Dominican idea. That's actually Thomas Aquinas saying that, that, that uh, better, to, better than to be a light for yourself is to cast light for others. Uh, and I, I think that brings me back to the Dominican character of Herbert, that, that, that that's what he did. Um, I mean, he was an overwhelming personality in some ways. I mean, he shouted and, uh, and swore and drank and a lot. Um, so there was lots of Herbert. You know. But he never got in the way of this lucidity of transmission. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that sensitivity to how a language works so as to inspire uh, and to inspire through the mind, not leaving the mind out of the, uh, uh, out of the picture. And that, it's lethal that. I mean, to be able to, to cast light and at the same time create a light which is a warmth and an encouragement and a, and a desire it, it is, it's, if you're a teacher, that's all you aspire to, to, to ever you know, be able to do with any kind of modicum of, of, of satisfactoriness. And, and Herbert had it in abundance. Uh, I mean, people would go to his lectures and they'd just be amazed that there was a possibility of talking like that. Yeah. And so that, 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 that use of language in order to communicate, it's both a theory of language and a use of language which you know, constructs a theory, do you see what I mean? Yeah. So he was an extraordinarily clear writer and speaker. Um, uh, it's kind of penetratingly clear and almost frighteningly clear. You sort of say, golly, I, I never thought like that. Would I ever be able to continue to think like that or do I just depend on Herbert thinking like that? 
And you, you could become dependent on Herbert and just repeat him. Yeah? But that's not what he was trying to do. He was trying to get you to, to actually, it's kind of Socratic, you know, trying to get you to, 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 to yield to the light rather mm. than get in the way of it. Do you and see? sometimes that necessitated the explosion exactly, of your Exactly, exactly. He could get angry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when people were obfuscating, mm -hmm. he could get angry. And he, that's why, you see, he was never, ever an academic. Mm -hmm. He never had a full-time teaching job, I remember. I, I, when I was in Bristol University, I got him to teach a whole year. Yeah. Just simply, Herbert, talk about Thomas Aquinas to these students. And he was brilliant. I mean, he was a brilliant teacher, but he never had a full-time teaching mm -hmm. job. Would it be fair to say, though, he was more of a teacher in the, you know, the sense of discipline than he was a writer? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so, because, you see, his writing is simply teaching written down. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, and... For me, that's that's what I do too. I don't write books that are bookish. I write books which are uh, which are kind of talk, mm -hmm. and it affects punctuation. By the way, uh, that the editors all get mad when you punctuate your sentences as if you are uttering them. Mm -hmm. It's quite different from how you punctuate a sentence for the eye. Punctuating a sentence for the ear is quite different, and it breaks all the rules which the Chicago Manual of Style lays down as to how to write good sentences actually awful awful book that uh, an awful tradition but anyway um uh, uh herbert punctuated the way he spoke yeah. i can't and imagine him worrying about breaking the oh absolutely not. <laughs> do I. I couldn't <laughs> give a fig for the show of galga manual style but um but i'm afraid it's rather imposed itself on the mm. academic world but it is interesting to see herbert's punctuation because it, it's about how speech works, not about how the eye reads the page. It's about how the sound gets mm. through to the mind, through the ear. And, uh, and that, I think, is, is something... That he, it, Herbert's intellect was very practical in that sense because it was geared towards the communication of ideas in a very direct kind of way. But it was oral, you're absolutely right, mm. uh, um, uh, rather, than, um, rather than written. Uh, and so the written word... You, I mean, if you knew Herbert and heard him, you can actually hear him speak. You can hear that Northumbrian drawl on the page. Do you mm -hmm. see what I mean? Uh, uh, you could almost imitate. I can't, but I mean, uh, there are people who can imitate yeah. Herbert. Yeah. And uh, there'll be people here this evening who knew Herbert. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I know Herbert. Yeah. I actually joined the order long after he, yeah, sure. he went to the mm. Lord. But we've spoken about Herbert, the pedagogue, the mm. thinker, the, the Thomist, the Wittgensteinian, the Marxist. Mm. What will be your memory of Herbert the man? Oh, oh, um, it's, it's hour after hour um, in the pub, which is usually typical. Uh, um, he did his thinking in the pub, um, and uh, you, that's where you, that's where you learnt from Herbert, basically. Uh, um, you'd say, but Herbert, and then he would usually patiently, sometimes impatiently, but usually patiently, he'd take you through it. And it, it was just an experience. It, I mean, it just reminded you, if you know, if you know your Plato's dialogues, it reminded you of that, including the symposium where at you know, the next morning, Socrates is still talking, he's the only one who's sober, and the rest are all asleep, um, but Herbert was still at it. I mean, uh, that's the way it was. So he, was, he, was a, he was a street thinker, a street talker, and he talked to anybody. So uh, I think it was just Herbert, a communicator and a lover of all sorts of men and women. He had a huge circle of friends. So, and I think that's one other thing which you know, brings you back to Thomas Aquinas, the centrality of friendship mm -hmm. was, uh, I mean, it was practically important to him. That he thought in and through his relationship with friends. So that, that emphasis which you find in Thomas on, uh, on, well, if you want an account of Thomas Aquinas on love, it's going to be an account of love as friendship, not love and in the sort of erotic, ecstatic modes, but actually, um, you know, friends who uh, regard each other as equals, they, that, that they, they are exchanging, and their mode of exchange is that of friendship, not that of, well, you know, that I think has to work together with the idea of you know, the teacher.
mm-hmm. uh, and the essential equality of the relationship between teacher and, and student is is something which um, I think you know again is perhaps very very demotic uh, and very Dominican. Um, uh, that again, going back to that that sermon in which uh, Herbert talks about Dominican obedience not being of a military top-down sort, but of obedience, commitment to the values of the community and uh, and to creating the community, which shares those values and shares a common intellectual life. However much that uh, intellectual life does consist in argument and argy bargy, I mean, he, 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 he thought. Palaver is the name of uh, how it goes, disagreement, until eventually you come to a common mind on essentials and diversity on everything else. And uh, uh, I think, again, I mean, Herbert was just an embodiment of that, 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 that kind of ideal of a certain kind of community. And that was the kind of community he, he believed in, and, yeah, and that's why I think you could find Herbert in a pub as frequently as you could find him in, in, in a place like this. I mean, the pub's across the road, yeah. and I think... Being you know, in a Dominican house with the pubs across the road sounds to me like a pretty fancy idea and very much Herbert. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is, thank you very much. Okay, and thank, thank you for you. your time. Yeah.